Hi everyone. Okay, so in my last video I talked about the fish in the Dead Sea sinkholes and you know how out of Israel a lot of these prophecies about the establishment of the modern state of Israel and that its legitimacy come from Ezekiel and you know I was just going to leave it there but today I was watching a video on end time prophecy explanation and the first thing they went to was the book of Ezekiel and the re-establishment of Israel in modern times as being the fulfillment of Ezekiel's prophecy and this can not be further from the truth and if you don't realize that the book of Ezekiel and prophecy in that is regarding Jesus and you say that today's Israel is fulfilling prophecy then you are denying Jesus because basically the modern state of Israel has to cut Jesus out of biblical prophecy out of anything from the Old Testament. They don't want to acknowledge Jesus was the prince or that Jesus was the king and they want to say that their Messiah is still coming and therefore they have to ignore the last 2,000 years as we know it of history and say that nothing happened in this time period and now Ezekiel is fulfilling prophecy in the re-establishment of the state of Israel. And I'm just going to show you how that is wrong and that any Christian proclaiming that this is true denies Jesus. So I'm in the book of Ezekiel chapter 25 and it says, The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against the Ammonites and prophesy against them. And they say unto the Ammonites, Let's hear the word of the Lord God. Thus saith the Lord God, because thou saith uh, against my sanctuary, when it was profaned, and against the land of Israel, when it was desolate, and against the house of Judah, when they went into captivity. Behold, therefore, I will deliver thee to men of the east for a possession, and they shall set their places in thee, and make their dwellings in thee, and they shall eat thy fruit, and they shall drink thy milk. And I will make Rabbah a stable for camels, and the Ammonites a couching place for flocks, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Okay, so the northern kingdom was taken away by the Assyrians before the southern kingdom of Judah was taken away by the Babylonians. And in 722 BCE, Assyria conquered the kingdom of Israel in the north and deported many of the residents of Samaria and its surroundings to other Assyrian provinces and brought deportees from other conquered territories to Samaria to take their place. So when the Bible talks about the Samaritan, they weren't necessarily the part of the uh, the ten tribes although some of them may have been returned to that area or there was a remnant left in that area but mainly Samaria or the northern kingdom was inhabited by these other peoples that Assyria had conquered so they had brought deportees from other conquered territories to Samaria to take their place excavations at Tal Hadid near Lod in Israel have unearthed material remains that contribute to our understanding of these transformative years. So here it's King Tiglath Pileser III of Assyria captures the city of Astaratu in modern Jordan. So deportation of residents from rebellious vassal states was one of the ways Mesopotamian empires maintained control of their territory. This practice was devised and largely used during the Neo-Assyrian Empire, especially during the reign of Tiglath Pileser III between 745 and 727 BCE and the Sargonid kings and later the Neo-Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. Mass deportations and resettlement of conquered peoples served as fundamental tool of statecraft, economic organization and imperial control in which rivals from the Assyrian core and the elite and craftsmen from defeated polities alike were grouped together and deported by isolating these groups within larger local populations. The Assyrian king ensured loyalty to the state and minimized the likelihood of resistance among the common people who were left without their traditional elite. 
And doesn't that sound familiar? Because today we have these mass migrations of depopulated people coming to the West and we are being inundated with massive amounts of people that have had their countries bombed and their lives destroyed and we have this forced multiculturalism. Um, and here we can see in this ancient tactic of these Mesopotamians why they are doing that. The most famous such expulsion was the de deportation of the Judahites to Babylonia by Nebuchadnezzar. This was done in two waves. First, the elites were exiled in 597 BCE and resettled in Babylonia, while about a decade later in 586 BCE, the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem, including its temple, and exiled the many of the city's inhabitants, resettling them in Babylonia as well. The Assyrian conquest of Israel was more than a century earlier, involved various exiles as well. They began under Tiglath Pileser III when he conquered the north and east of Israel. So it says here, in the days of King Pekah of Israel, King Tiglath Pileser of Assyria came and captured Ijon, Abel, Beth, Makkah, Jonah, Genoa, Kedesh, Hazor, Gilead, Galilee, the entire region of Naphtali and deported the inhabitants to Assyria. So this is obviously from an Assyrian text. This left Israel with only its core territory in the Sumerian hill country. Not long afterwards, Israel rebelled against the Assyrian overlords and the kingdom was conquered entirely in 722 to 720 BCE. The inhabitants of Samaria were exiled. It says, in the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria. He deported the Israelites to Assyria and settled them in Hala at the river Harbor and the river Gozan and in the towns of Media. The Babylonian policy was one of organized resettlement where the social structures of the Judahites were largely maintained in exile, albeit with modifications. They had to reinvent their new home in language, in narrative and in myth as a coherent group and due to various other circumstances, they were able to negotiate the disruptive and disorientating experience and to adjust their identity accordingly. The Assyrians, however, spread their deportees around and the goal of assimilating them into their new regions and thus making them disappear as separate entities. This helps to explain why many Judahites remain loyal to their collective identities in Babylonia and eventually return to their native land, whereas the Israelites who were exiled mostly disappeared, becoming the Lost Ten Tribes. So, you know, we can see that this tactic was about destroying cultures and this is what we have today destroying cultures destroying identities of who we are and where we came from so the exiles who came to israel assyrian policy in the levant from the days of tiglath pileser iii until its decline completely transformed the levantine societies as part of their attempt to mix populations, the Assyrians sometimes settled newly emptied lands with deportees from other parts of the empire. Israel experienced this as well. And this is from an Assyrian text. The king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Qatar, Ava, Hamath, and Sepharvim, and he settled them in the towns of Samaria in places of the Israelites. They took possession of Samaria and dwelt in its towns. This verse describes how the Assyrian resettled the, in Israel various foreign peoples, mostly Mesopotamian origins. This terse description leaves us with many questions. What portion of local population remained in the country? How many newcomers arrived? What was their status in the new homeland and how much influence did they have? How did the locals and newcomers interact with subsequent centuries? Now, even if there were people that stayed in this region from the Israelites, they would have been 
intermarrying and intermix which would have changed them beyond being Israelite anymore. So it says here, unfortunately we know very little about the circumstances of the arrival of the deportees settled in Samaria. The Bible offers a list of places of origin but we don't know how accurate this list is or how and why these peoples were conquered. How many there were, whether they brought any possessions with them etc. We can say that war, devastation and difficult journey across hundreds of miles were their lot. The status of their gods would have been captured and taken to Assyria, their leaders most probably executed and their homes confiscated. So we can see here in Ezekiel that by the time of the captivity of the southern kingdom to Babylon, it was the Ammonites who took advantage of this because they went against God's sanctuary and they profaned it and against the land of Israel. Behold, therefore, I will deliver thee to the men of the east for a possession and they shall set their places in thee and make their dwellings in thee and shall eat thy fruit and they shall drink thy milk. So God is uh, now declaring that he will come against these people for taking advantage of the deportation. So who were the Ammonites, Moabites and Edomites in the Bible? When the kingdoms of Israel and Judah controlled the land of Canaan, the kingdoms of Ammon, Moab and Edom ruled east of the Jordan. Although the Bible offers information about these three Iron Age kingdoms, recent archaeological discoveries are bringing to light fuller picture of them in his article, Ammon, Moab and Edom, gods and kingdoms east of the Jordan. So who were the Ammonites? In the Bible, they were described as being descendants of Ben-Ami, who was the son of Lot, Abraham's nephew and Lot's younger daughter in Genesis 19.38. Capital of the Iron Age Kingdom of Ammon was Rabbah, which is located at modern day Ammon. Jordan Burnett describes the boundaries of Ammon, the Ammonite heartland, comprised the north central Transjordan Plateau, encircled by the upper Jabbok within a 12.5 mile radius of its capital at the headwaters of Jabbok. The Ammonites' primary deity was the god Milcom. Descriptions of Milcom have been uncovered through archaeological excavations as have representations of Ammonite kings such as the monumental statue uncovered at Rabah in 2010. So who were the Moabites in the Bible? The Moabites are said to have descended from Moab, the son of Lot, and his oldest daughter. The kingdom of Moab stretched north and south of Arnon River with its capital at Dibon, the Moabites worshipped the god Chemosh, who may be depicted in the Balua stele, dated in the end of the Late Bronze Age, the most famous Moabite king from the archaeological record at least is Mesha. The large inscription left behind is the longest Moabite text dating to the 9th century BCE. So they're basically the same people as the Ammonites, they came from Lot and his two daughters. In the story after the destruction of Sodom, Lot's daughters have children with him because he has no wife left to uh, prolong his family line. Who were the Edomites? So in the Bible, the Edomites are the descendants of Esau, Jacob's twin and Isaac's oldest son. So they're all part of the same family. The Edomites controlled an area east of the Araba from the Zered to the Gulf of Aqaba. Their capital was Bozra, which sat in the northern parts of the territory. Although no name of an Edomite deity is given in the Bible, archaeologists know from inscriptions that the Edomites' principal deity was Quas or Quas. Several Edomite places of worship, the cultic figure, figurines have been uncovered. One of the most notable is the depiction of an Edomite goddess wearing three-horned headdress from the site of Kitmit, Israel. Interesting because horns represents crowns and three crowns is what the Pope wears. So here's another reference to this three-tiered tiara, the papal crown. The kingdoms of Ammon, Moab and Edom fought with the Israelites and the Judahites over territory. The Bible presents things from the Israelite and Judahites point of view 
The archaeological discoveries help show us the other side by looking at what these ancient peoples wrote and left behind. We are able to better understand their perspective. We now have a fuller picture of their kings, gods and daily life. So when we're talking about Eden, here it's uh, telling us in the New World Encyclopedia, when Israel divided into two kingdoms, Eden became a dependency of the kingdom of Judah. In the time of Jehoshaphat, the Bible mentions the king of Eden who made common cause with Israel and Judah against Moab and met with the prophet Elijah, a miracle ensured relieving their drought-stricken armies with a flood of water. And this is kind of an interesting statement because it relates to the rivers becoming blood. It says, with a flood of water, the color of blood flowing from the direction of Edom. So does that mean that maybe Revelation is talking about the waters becoming blood because it's um, an invasion of Edom, perhaps? However, the Second Chronicles 20, 10, 23 reports significant rebellion against Jehoshaphat, consisting of forces from Eden, Ammon, and Moab. So these three nations are united. Through God's intervention, the invaders eventually turned against one another and thus failing in their plan. Edom was also revolted in the time of King Jehoram of Judah, mid 9th century. The elected king is of its own, King, 2 Kings 8.20. The writer of Kings reports that to this day, Edom has been in rebellion against Judah. Jerome's son Amaziah attacked and defeated the Edomites, seizing Selah. However, it would not be until the 2nd century BCE that Edom came completely under Jewish rule. In the time of Nebuchadnezzar II, Edomites helped plunder Jerusalem and slaughter the Jews. For this reason, the later prophets denounced Edom violently. The Edomites were held in contempt by many Israelites, hence the book of Psalms takes a very different view than does Deut Deuteronomy towards the Edomite, portraying God as saying, Moab is my washpot over Edom, I will cast out my shoe. So the kingdom of Edom drew much of its livelihood from the caravan trade between Egypt and the Levant, Mesopotamia and southern Arabia along the incense route of the King's Highway. The Edomites were one of the several states in the region for whom trade was vital due to the scarcity of arable land. Edom's location on the southern highlands left it with only a small strip of land that received sufficient rain for farming. In fact, consistent with the Song of Deborah's emphasis on Yahweh's role in providing rain from Seir. Eden probably exported salt and balsam used to, for perfume and temple incense in the ancient world from the Dead Sea region. In the time of Amaza, Sela Petra was its principal stronghold, while Elat and Ezron Gerber were its seaports. So again, the kings road the spice road and the silk road were how edom made its profit and it was not a farming community it was not a building or mining community that were middlemen of merchants and traders and edom took advantage of this during the exile as they took over jerusalem's Roll on this trading route. So in the New World Encyclopedia it states that during the biblical period of the kings, Edom was a vassal state of the kingdom of Judah. During the Babylonian exile, the Edomites took advantage of the situation to plunder Jerusalem and explorate large portions of Judah's land. This led to particularly bitter feelings on the part of the Jews, so much so that in the Talmudic period, Eden became a symbol for the Roman Empire, the Jews' arch oppressors. Which is kind of strange because during the Hasmonean kings, they integrated Edom into Judah. In the Roman times, Idumea accepted Judaism and produced a particularly famous native son in King Herod the Great and his royal line, Idumeans fought side by side with Jews against Romans. Possibilities for further reconciliation were dashed with the Jews' defeat in the Jewish-Roman wars, after which Edom also ceased to exist. So they didn't cease to exist, they simply were integrated into this 
kingdom of Judea, which then went out into the world in the form of Radahite Jews and the Pharisaical Judaism. So Ezekiel goes on to say, For thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast clapped thine hands and stamped with the feet and rejoiced in heart with all thy despite against the land of Israel. Behold, therefore, I will stretch out mine hand upon thee and will deliver thee for a spoil to the heathen. And I will cut thee off from the people and I will cause thee to perish out of the countries. I will destroy thee and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, because that Moab and Seir do say, Behold, the house of Judah is like unto all the heathen. Therefore, behold, I will open the side of Moab from the cities from, the, from his cities which are on his frontiers, the glory of the country, Beth Jeshimoth, Balmion, and Kiriathium, unto the men of the east with the Ammonites. And I will give them in possession that the Ammonites may not be remembered among the nations. And I will execute judgments upon Moab, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, because that Edom hath dealt against the house of Judah by taking vengeance, and hath greatly offended and revenged himself upon them. Therefore thus says the Lord God, I will also stretch out my hand upon Edom, and will cut off man and beast from it, and I will make it desolate from Teman, and they of Dedan shall fall by the sword, and I will lay my vengeance upon Edom, and by the hand of my people Israel and they shall do in Edom according to mine anger and according to mine fury, and they shall know my vengeance, saith the Lord God. Thus saith the Lord God, because the Philistines have dealt by revenge and have taken vengeance with a despiteful heart to destroy it for the old hatred. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will stretch out my hand upon the Philistines and I will cut off the Cherethims and destroy the remnant of the sea coast. And I will execute great vengeance upon them with furious rebukes, and they shall know that I am the Lord when I shall lay my vengeance upon them. Now the Philistines do not exist anymore. The Edomites were integrated into Judah, and their lands do not exist anymore. The Ammonites disappeared from history, and I think the Moabites may have gone the same way. So in Ezra 4, 6, this is the God's word translation. It says, The Samaritans stopped the work. When the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the people who returned from exile were building a temple for the Lord God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel and the heads of the families. They told them, We want to help you build because we worship the same God you worship. We have been sacrificing to him since the time of King Esarahadan of Assyria who brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Jeshua and the rest of the head of Israel's families told them it isn't right for your people and our people to build a temple for our God together. We must build it alone for the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus of Persia ordered us to do. So we can see from this translation that the people who were asking them to rebuild the temple were not northern tribe people of Israel. They were saying they were brought there from the king of Assyria and they worshipped the God that was in the land when they arrived. In the New King James Version, it doesn't say Samaritans, it says resistance to rebuilding the temple. It says now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the descendants of the captivity were building the temple of the Lord God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and the heads of their father's houses and said to them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as you do. So you can see here that it's the same story. The other translation is saying it's the Samaritans. This is saying it was just the people who were inhabiting the land brought there by the Assyrian kings. It goes on to say, in the reign of uh, Asturias, in the beginning of his reign, they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. In the days of Artaxerxes, also 
Bishlam, Mithridath, Tabul, and the rest of their companions wrote to Artaxerxes, king of Persia, and the letter was written in Aramaic script and translated into the Aramaic language. Rehum, the commander, and Shimashai, the scribe, wrote a letter against Jerusalem to King Artaxerxes in this fashion. It says, From Rehum, the commander, Shimashai, the scribe, and the rest of their companions, representatives of the Dinites and Aphrashites, the Tarpalites, the people of Persia and Erech and Babylon and Shushan, the Dehavites, the Alamites and the rest of the nations whom the great and noble Osnapa took captive and settled in the cities of Samaria and the remainder beyond the river and so forth. So all of these people were taken and they were placed in the land of Samaria or the northern kingdom of Israel to re-inhabit it. It says here in verse 11, this is a copy of the letter that they sent to him, to King Artaxerxes from your servants, the men of the region beyond the river and so forth. Let it be known to the king that the Jews who came up from you have come to us at Jerusalem and are building the rebellious and evil city and are finishing its walls and repairing the foundations. Let it now be known to the king that if this city is built and the walls completed, they will not pay tax, tribute or custom and the king's treasury will be diminished. See here we have this tax coming up again that it was important that people captured by Babylon pay tax and bend the knee to its statute. So verse 14 says, Now because we receive support from the palace, it is not proper for us to see the king's dishonor. Therefore we have sent and informed the king that search may be made in the book of the records of your fathers, and you will find in the book of the records and know that this city is a rebellious city, harmful to kings and provinces, and that they have incited sedition within the city in former times for which cause this city was destroyed. We inform the king that if this city is rebuilt and its walls are completed, the result will be that you will have no dominion beyond the river. And the king sent an answer to Rehum, the commander, to Shemashai, the scribe, to the rest of their companions who dwell in Samaria, and to the remainder beyond the river, peace and so forth. The letter which he sent us has been clearly read before me and I gave the command and a search has been made and it was found that this city in former times has revolted against kings and rebellion and sedition have been fostered in it. There have also been mighty kings over Jerusalem who have ruled over all the region beyond the river and tax, tribute and custom were paid to them. Now give the command to make these men cease that this city may not be built until the command is given by me. Take heed now that you do not fail to do this. Why should damage increase to hurt to the hurt of the kings? Now when the copy of King Artaxerxes' letter was read before Rehum, Shemashai, the scribe, and the companions, they went up in haste to Jerusalem against the Jews and by force of arms made them cease. Thus the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem, ceased and it was discontinued until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So according to Wiki, the book of Ezekiel is the third of the later prophets in the Tanakh and one of the major prophetic books following Isaiah and Jeremiah. According to the book itself, it records six visions of the prophet Ezekiel exiled in Babylon during the 22 years from 593 to 571 BCE. Although it is the product of a long and complex history and does not necessarily preserve the very words of the prophet. So the visions of the book are structured around three themes. Judgment of Israel, chapters 1 to 24. Judgment on the nations, chapters 25 to 32. And future blessings for Israel, chapters 33 to 48. Its themes include the concept of the presence of God, purity, Israel and divine community and individual responsibility to God. In Ezekiel 27, the word 
of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Now thou, son of man, take up a lamentation for Tyrus, and say unto Tyrus, O thou that art situate at the entry of the sea, which art a merchant of the people for many isles. Thus saith the Lord God, O Tyrus, thou hast said, I am of perfect beauty. Now this ties in with the Lucifer story and I'm going to do a separate video on that. However, if we look here, it's talking about people for many isles. And when we look in Revelation, it tells us how the great earthquake where every island and every mountain was moved out of its place or was no more. And, you know, sometimes these prophecies are not talking literally about islands or mountains, but they are talking about regions within these mountains which are nations or kingdoms. Thy borders are in the midst of the sea, thy builders have perfected thy beauty, they have made all thy shipboards of fir trees of Senna, they have taken cedars from Lebanon to make masts for thee. Of the oak of Bashan they have made thine oars, the company of the Asherites have made thy benches of ivory throughout the isles of Chittim. Fine linen with broidered work from Egypt was that which thou spreadest forth to be thy sail blue and purple. From the isles of Elisha was that which covered thee. The inhabitants of Zidon and Arvad were thy mariners, thy wise men, O Tyrus, that were in thee, were thy pilots. So, you know, when we also see that the woman is burnt in Revelation, referring to Jerusalem, it's these merchants standing far off, weeping because their goods are no longer sold in her. They're in their ships, standing far off, watching her being burnt. The ancients of Gebal and the wise men thereof were in thy caulkers. All the ships of the sea with their mariners were in thee to occupy thy merchandise. They of Persia and of Lud and of Put were in thine army, thy men of war. They hanged the shield and helmet in thee. They set forth thy comeliness. It says, Tarshish was thy merchant by reason of the multitude of all kinds of riches with silver, iron, tin and lead. They traded in thy fares. Javan, tu Tubal, and Meshech, they were thy merchants. They traded the person of men, so they were slave traders, and vessels of brass in thy markets. So when we look at Gog and Magog, the chief prince of Tubal and Meshech, these are the tribes of Japheth that trade in human trade on this silk spice road. And Javan is said to be the descendant of the Greeks. But Javan is not included in the Gog Magog prophecy. They of the house of Togomar traded in thy fairs with horses and horsemen and mules. The men of Dedan, they were merchants. Many isles were their merchandise of thine hand. They brought thee for a present horns of ivory and ebony. Syria was thy merchant by reason of the multitude of their wares of thy making they occupied in fairs with emeralds purple and broidered work and fine linen and coral and agate Judah and the land of Israel they were thy merchants they traded in thy market wheat of Minith and Panag and honey and oil and balm Damascus was thy merchant in thy multitude of the wares of thy making for the multitude of all riches in the wine of Halbon and white wool. Dan and also Javan going to and fro occupied in thy fairs. Bright iron, Cassia and Calamus were in thy market. Dedan was thy merchant in precious clothes for chariots. Arabia and all the princes of Kedar they occupied with thee in lambs and rams and goats. In these were they thy merchants. 
merchants of Sheba and Rama. They were thy merchants, they occupied in thy fairs, chief of all spices and all precious stones and gold. Haran and Kena and Eden, the merchants of Sheba, Ashur and Chil Chilmad were thy merchants. These were the merchants of all sorts of things in blue clothes and broided work and in chests of rich apparel bound with cords and made of cedar among thy merchandise. The ships of Tarshish did sing of thee in thy market and thou wast replenished and made very glorious in the midst of the seas. Thy rowers have brought thee into great waters. The east wind hath broken thee in the midst of the sea. Thy riches and thy fares, thy merchandise, thy mariners and thy pilots, thy caulkers and the occupiers of thy merchandise and all the men of war that are in thee and in all thy company which is in the midst of thee shall fall into the midst of the seas in the day of ruin. The suburbs shall take at the sound of the cry of the pilots. It goes on to say, And all that handle the oar and the mariners and all the pilots of the sea shall come down from their ships, they shall stand upon the land, and shall cause their voice to be heard against thee, and shall cry bitterly, and shall cast up dust upon their heads, and they shall wallow themselves in the ashes, and they shall make themselves utterly bald for thee, and grind them with sackcloth, and they shall weep for thee with bitterness of heart and bitter wailing, and in their wailing shall take up a lamentation for thee, a lament over thee, saying, What city is like Tyrus, like the destroyed in the midst of the sea? When thy waves went forth out of the sea, thou fillest many people, thou didst enrich the king of the earth with the multitude of thy riches and thy merchandise. And in the time when thou shalt be broken by the sea in the depths of the waters, thy merchandise and all the company in the midst of, the, of thee shall fall. All the inhabitants of the isles shall be astonished at thee, and their kings shall be sore afraid, they shall be troubled in their countenance. The merchants among the people shall hiss at thee, thou shalt be a terror and never shall be any more. So let's see historically how this has already happened, and it happened a long time ago. So Tyre in modern day Lebanon was one of the oldest cities in the world dating back over 4,000 years during which it had been inhabited almost continuously was one of the most important and at times the dominant city of Phoenicia whose citizens claimed it had been founded by the great god Melkart. The city was an ancient Phoenician port and industrial center with which in myth is known as the birthplace of Europa who gave Europe its name. Interesting. And Dido of Carthage who gave aid to and fell in love with Aenus of Troy. The name means rock and city consisted of two parts, the main trade center on an island and old Tyre about a half a mile opposite on the mainland. The old city known as Ushu or earlier name for Malkut was founded in 2750 BCE and the trade center grew up shortly after. In time the island complex became more prosperous and populated than Ushu and was heavily fortified. The prosperity of Tyre attracted the attention of King Nebuchadnezzar II of Babylon, uh, who laid siege to the city for 13 years in the 6th century BCE without breaking their defences. During this siege, most of the inhabitants of the mainland city abandoned it for the relative safety of the island city. Ushu became a suburb of Tyre on the mainland and remained so until the coming of Alexander the Great. The Tyrians were known as workers in dye from the shells of the Murex shellfish. This purple dye was highly valued and held royal connotations in the ancient world. It also gave the Phoenicians the name from the Greeks Phoenicus, which means purple people. The city-state was the most powerful in all of Phoenicia after surpassing its sister state Sidon. Tyre is referenced in the Bible in the New Testament where it is claimed that both Jesus and St. Paul of the Apostle visited the city and remains famous in military history for Alexander the Great's siege. T 
Today, Tyre is listed by UNESCO as a World Heritage Site and efforts continue to preserve its history in the face of ongoing conflict in the region. So archaeological evidence dates the earliest human habitation of Tyre at 2900 to 2750 BCE with the earliest homes having been abandoned and permanent habitation continuing from the later date. The city was already thriving during the period of Egypt's 18th dynasty. In 1550 to 1292 BCE and when they supplied the ruling house of Egypt with the expensive clothing dyed in the shade known as Tyrian purple which would continue to be associated with royalty through the Roman Empire and even later. Tyre continued to prosper during the reign of the Assyrian king Ashurinus Serpil II in 884 to 859 BC, who listed it among the cities who paid him tribute that included silver, gold, tin, bronze and other precious metals and material. And they also paid tribute to King Solomon in the Bible. Tyre was in its golden age around the 10th century BCE and in the 8th was colonising other cities in the area and enjoying great wealth and prosperity owing primarily an alliance with Israel. The Tyrian alliance and trade agreement with David, king of Israel, was initiated by the king of Tyre, Abibal, who sent the new king timber from the fabled cedars of Lebanon as Abibal's son Hiram is said to have done for King David's son Solomon. This alliance resulted in very lucrative partnership which benefited both parties according to scholar Richard Miles. Commercially, this deal not only gave Tyre privileged access to the valuable markets of Israel, Judea and northern Syria, it also provided further opportunities for jo joint overseas ventures. Indeed, a Tyrian Israelite expedition travelled to the Sudan and Somalia and perhaps even as far as the Indian Ocean. Another development which encouraged the wealth of Tyre seems to have been a religion revolution in the city under the reign of Abibal and Hiram which elevated Malkart over one of the more popular divine couples of Phoenician religion Baal and Astarte. Primacy of Malkart whose name means king of the city, drew power away from the priests and the traditional pantheon of the gods and placed it at the disposal of the palace as Malkart was closely associated with the ruling house, Miles comments. It seems that the desire to bring the temples to heal lay behind the royal decision to replace the traditional chief deities of Tyre with a new god, Malkart. As noted, Malkart was not new to Tyre and had always been venerated there but now took on greater authority and prominence. The Tyrians were never monotheistic but with the elevation of Malkart to the city pleased the monotheistic Israelite ruling house which venerated the one god Yahweh and further a productive working relationship in trade. The Tyrians provided Israel with precious metals for their temple and famous purple dyed clothing for royalty in exchange for necessary goods and luxuries, Miles writes. In exchange for precious metals and clothing, the Israelites would deliver annual provisions of over 400,000 litres of wheat, 420,000 litres of olive oil, and a great boon for Tyre with its limited territory. The result was not only an increase in wealth of the palace, but through a more efficient distribution of what that wealth increased prosperity for the whole city. This affluence attracted the attention of the Babylonians after the fall of the Assyrian Empire in 612 BCE and King Nebuchadnezzar II lay siege to the city in 586 BCE. The siege lasted 13 years and although the walls of Tyre held, its commercial ventures suffered and prosperity declined. Tyre revived under the Persian Archimedean Empire which took the city in 539 BC and held it until the coming of Alexander the Great. Although the Persians eventually placed their own government in the Phoenician cities, they did not interfere with the religious or political traditions already established. And at first, anyway, Tyre was allowed to keep its king, who was still associated with Malkut. The king now, not the priest, was the bridge between the temporal and celestial worlds and the needs of the heavenly gods could closely correspond with the political exegenesis of the palace. 
This new religion policy encouraged more closely knit bond among the people of the city by designating them as set apart from the other city-states of Phoenicia and so special in the eyes of their god, Miles wrote. The king even introduced an elaborate new ceremonial to celebrate the annual festival of Malka each spring in a carefully choreographed festival called the Egesis. An effigy of the god was placed on a giant raft before being ritually burnt as it drifted out to sea, while hymns were sung by the assembled crowd. For the Tyrians, as for many other ancient Near Eastern peoples, the emphasis fell upon the restorative properties of fire, for the god himself was not destroyed but revived by the smoke, and the burning of the effigy thus represented rebirth. To emphasize the importance of the Egerusis in maintaining internal coercion of the Tyrian people, for all foreigners had to leave the city for the duration of the ceremony. So this is very uh, reminiscent of the phoenix rising from the fire. It was this ceremony and the importance it held for people which would bring about Tyre's destruction and the slaughter or enslavement of the populace in 332 BCE. Alexander the Great arrived in the city during his conquest of the Archimedean Empire, fresh from the subjugation of Sidon, which had surrendered and offered lavish gifts. He demanded Tyre's immediate surrender following Sidon's lead and the Tyrians acknowledged Alexander's greatness and presented him with gifts equal in value to those he had received from Sidon. All seemed to be going well and pleased with their submission, Alexander said he would present a sacrifice in honour of their god in the temple of Malkut. The Tyrians could not allow this as it would be sacrilegious for a foreigner to present a sacrifice in what was considered the literal home of their god and even more so the ceremony of the Egesis was close at hand. Scholar Ian Worthington describes what followed. As a milk, king of Tyre proposed a compromise. Tyre would become Alexander's ally, but he should sacrifice on the mainland at Old Tyre, opposite the island. An angry Alexander sent envoys to say this was unacceptable and that the Tyrians had to surrender. They murdered the envoys and threw them off their walls. Alexander then ordered the siege of Tyre. He dismantled much of the old mainland city of Ushu, as well as using fallen debris, rock and felled trees, filling in the sea between the mainland and the island to create a land bridge for his war machines. Over the centuries since, this caused heavy sedimentation to occur and permanently linked the island to the mainland, which is why Tyre is not an island today. After a siege of seven months, Alexander used his man-made causeway to battle down the walls of Tyre and take the city. Tyre's 30,000 inhabitants were either massacred or sold into slavery, and the city was destroyed by Alexander in his rage at their having defied him for so long. Fall of Tyre led to the further development of Carthage, already established as a Phoenician colony in 8. 14 BCE. As many survivors of the siege who were able to escape Alexander's wrath by bribery or stealth emigrated to their former colony in north of Africa. Following Alexander's death in 323 BCE, his generals fought each other over the territories he had conquered with different regions controlled sometimes in fairly quick succession by one or the other. The general Laomedon of Mytilene held Tyre at first and it changed hands throughout the conflict. Known as the Wars of the Diadochi, the Wars of Alexander's successors, until it was taken by Antigonus I in 315 BC, whose successors held it until Phoenicia was conquered by Antiochus III in 223 187 BC of the Seleucid Empire in 198 BC. So Antiochus III was concerning himself with the expansion of his own territories when the Second Punic War broke out between Rome and Carthage in 218 BC. Hannibal Barca I, the great Carthaginian general, was aided and supported by Philip V of Macedon, who convinced Antiochus III to join him in conquering Egypt in 205 BC. 
Egypt was Rome's major source of grain, however, and they threatened Antiochus III with dire consequences should he proceed with Philip V's proposal. Antiochus III backed off and the Romans defeated Philip V at Battle of Sinocephale in 197 BCE. Antiochus III, fearing Rome might eliminate him next, made a preemptive strike in 191 BCE. So the Romans took the city as a colony in 64 BCE when the Roman general and consul Pompey the Great annexed the whole of Phoenicia. Tyre was rebuilt and refurbished under the Romans who ironically had destroyed the city of Carthage where the surviving Tyrians had earlier fled to. Rome built the roads, monuments and aqueducts which can still be seen in the modern day. And the city flourished under Rome rule but declined after the fall of the Roman Empire. It continued on as port city under the eastern half of Rome, the Byzantine Empire, until the 7th century CE when it was taken in the Muslim conquest of the region. So the city was controlled by Christian crusaders in 1124 following the First Crusade and became an important trade centre linking the west with the east via the Silk Road. During this time, Tyre continued to produce its famous purple dye and prospered as the seat of an archbishopric of the church and one of the most important defences of the Kingdom of Jerusalem in maintaining a Christian presence in the region. Tyre was taken by the Muslim Mal Mamluk Sultanate in 1291 and after the production of purple dye and garments ended, as cheaper dyes were now available. In 1516, the city became part of the Ottoman Empire who held it through to 1918 when after the success of the Arab revolt it became part of the Arab Kingdom of Syria. By this time the Tyrians relied largely on fishing industry which had always been an important aspect of their economy and far less on the production of the kinds of craft that characterised Tyre's past greatness. In the present day Tyre relies primarily on tourism to sustain its economy. So as we can see from Ezekiel that Tyre was destroyed by Alexander the Great and it was never really ever great again. It was always conquered by one of these beast systems and ruled by them. Ezekiel goes on to tell us about the king of Tyre and as we can see from this last article, the king was placed as God in the temple of Tyre as Malkart. Sounds a lot like Malcolm from the Ammonite God. It says, The word of the Lord came to me again, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, Beside, Because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seed of God, in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man, and not God. Though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. A lot of people use this, verse as again i said earlier for lucifer or satan but clearly it's not lucifer or satan behold thou art wiser than daniel there is no secret that thy can hide from thee with thy wisdom and with thine understanding thou hast gotten the riches and has gotten gold and silver into thy treasures by thy great wisdom and by a traffic hast thou increased thy riches and thine heart is lifted up because of thy riches Therefore thus says the Lord God, because thou art, hast set thine heart as the heart of God. Behold, therefore I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw thy swords against the beauty of thy wisdom, and they shall defile thy brightness. And they shall bring thee down to the pit, and thou shalt die the death of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. Wilt thou yet say before him that slayeth thee, I am God? But thou shalt be a man, and no God in the hand of him that slayeth thee. Thou shalt die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say to him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in thy beauty, that hast been in Eden the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, the topaz, 
and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald and the carbuncle and gold, the workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that was, that was created. Thou art an anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God, thou hast walked up and down in the midst of stones, of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in those ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. So is this talking about Satan? Is this talking about Lucifer? Is this talking about King of Tyre? Because Clearly, the previous verses were talking about the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Edomites, and now it's talking about the Tyrian or the King of Tyre, the Phoenicians, how they will be destroyed. It's not talking about Satan, the serpent in the garden. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence and thou hast sinned therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God and I will destroy thee O covering cherub from the midst of the stones of fire so as we know the kingdom of heaven we have the three parts of heaven or God's thirds the three peoples that were in heaven it was the Egyptians it was the Assyrian and it was Israel and all three of them in their time were cast out of the mountain of God. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty that has corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. If this is a kingdom that's religion considers its ruler as a god. Just like Egypt, Pharaoh was god. Just like Assyria, their rulers made themselves gods like Nimrod. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquities of thy traffic. Therefore I will bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all of them that behold thee. Now remember the ritual that they had for their God. They would burn the God on a raft, and he would be reborn from this boat or raft all they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee thou shalt be a terror and never shalt thou be any more again the word of the lord came unto me saying son of man set thy face against zidon and prophesy against it and say thus saith the lord god behold i am against the oak zidon and i will be glorified in the midst of thee and they shall know that i am the lord when i shall have executed judgments in her and shall be sanctified in her for i will send into her pestilence and blood into her streets and the wounded shall be judged in the midst of her by the sword upon her on every side and they shall know that i am the lord now this is what alexander did he built a man-made bridge of land from the mainland to the island and he set about them on every side and there shall be no more picking briar unto the house of Israel or, or any grieving thorn of all that they are around about them that despise them and they shall know that I am the Lord God. Now this is what happened when the house of Israel or at least the southern kingdom re-established in the land of Judah. By that stage, Tyre was no longer a problem for them. Thus saith the Lord God, when I shall have gathered the house of Israel from the people among whom they are scattered and shall be sanctified in them in the sight of the heathen, they shall, then shall they dwell in their land that I have given to my servant Jacob. And they shall dwell safely therein and shall build houses and plant vineyards. Yea, they shall dwell with confidence when I have executed judgments upon those that despise them round about them and they shall know that I am the Lord their God. And they did that until they were occupied by the Greek Empire and finally, more violently, the Roman Empire. So Assyria and Tyre 
and the other Phoenician city-states. Assyria had a long tradition of maintaining economic contacts with the Phoenician city-state, but its westward expansion resulted in increasingly closer relations, while Tyre in particular benefited from Assyria's protection and preferential treatment. The representatives of the Assyrian Empire did not hesitate to intervene directly in its affairs when they saw fit. So the Great Migration of the 12th century BC changed the population profile of the Middle East and new groups of people such as the Arameans, the Philistines and the Phrygians appear in the historical record. Yet we have observed a remarkable continuity in the area of what is today the Lebanese coast. This narrow strip of land between the sea and the impressive Lebanon mountain range accommodated some of the most important harbours of the Eastern Mediterranean, namely Sidon, Byblos and the two island cities of Tyre and Arwood of the Syrian coast near Tartus, where the Canaanite culture of the Bronze Age continued to flourish. Now Asher, biblical character, was the second son of Shem, son of Noah. Assyria was named after him, although the name of Asher is sometimes used to refer to the place where his descendants dwell in Numbers and Ezekiel. He is on the timeline of the Bible after the flood. Assyria came from the earlier Arcadians who were a united people with the Sumerians from the Mesopotamian Empire. So the alphabet, Phoenicians invented the alphabet. The famous sequence of letters known to much of the world date back to the 16th century BCE. A fairly small group of traders and merchants known as the Phoenicians created the foundation for the modern English alphabet and other alphabets. So when Phoenicians created their new alphabet, they worked from symbols that were already in use among the Semitic speaking peoples of Canaan and Mesopotamia. As early as 3000 BCE, the Sumerians and the Egyptians had already invented writing systems based on symbols. These early scripts were primary used, primarily used by merchants and traders to record contracts, receipts and lists of goods. In this book, uh, Guide to Understanding Sumerian, Assyrian, Babylonian, Canaanite and so on, uh, Sumerian and Akkadian worshipped Tammuzi, Tammuz or Tammuz, name of the Sumerian shepherd god and god of agriculture who was worshipped by the Habiru, the Hebrews, as well as the Syrians and Phoenicians. So there's a connection here between the Sumerian Arcadians and the Hebrews and the Phoenicians. The name Tammuz can be found in ancient tablets Tammuz and Ishtar. So before Malquet, the Phoenicians worshipped Ishtar and Tammuz god system. It says in Mesopotamian and Babylonian mythologies, Dumuzi is the consort of Inanna who has been identified and or associated with the Phoenician goddess Ishtar. The lover of Adon in the Phoenician mythology, Dumuzi was also known as Tammuz in Mesopotamia and Adon, Adonis in the Phoenician and Syrian. In Wikipedia, it says the Phoenicians were a Semitic speaking people of somewhat unknown origin who emerged in the Levant around 3000 BC. The term Phoenicia is an ancient Greek exonym that most likely describes one of their most famous exports, a dye also known as Tyrian purple. It is debated whether Phoenicians were actually distinct from the broader group of Semitic speaking peoples known as Canaanites. Historian Robert Dews believes the term Canaanites corresponds to the ethnic group referred to as Phoenicians by the ancient Greeks. However, according to archaeologist Jonathan N. Tubb, Ammonites, Moabites, Israelites and Phoenicians undoubtedly achieved their own cultural identities and yet ethnically were all called Canaanites, the same people who settled in farming villages in the region in the 8th millennium BC. Now, I actually think that they come from Sumeria or Acadia were related to the Assyrians who 
settled this area, but they've also mixed. In this article on the origin of the Phoenicians, uh, there's three versions of their origin. And I think the third option sounds the most likely. It says the Sea Peoples. The third theory shown above was also related to the Sea Peoples, so let us consider it next. As it states that the Sea Peoples conquered the cities, which we have come to know as Phoenician. After that event, the intruders were said to have merged with the local people to give rise to the Phoenicians. The obstacle this theory faces is that there is no archaeological or other evidence showing the Phoenician cities were ever conquered by the Sea Peoples. This is not only attested by Moscati and Bondi, but also Pritchard and Bikai, whose excavations revealed not only lack of destruction, but showed the continuity of the Phoenician society during this time. Therefore, this proposition also fails. As a result of these considerations, we see the events surrounding 12,000 BC do not identify an origin for the Phoenician people. Clearly, these people and their society existed prior to 1200 BC and continued after that date. This still leaves two possible origin theories in front of us. However, before we can determine which one is supported by the available data, it is necessary to extract some relevant factors concerning known events which took place during these early years of Byblos, which we are told was the first Phoenician city. The assertion will also be assessed. So Byblos stood along with Sidon and Tyre as one of the leading cities of the Phoenician people. It had also been often cited as one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities in the world, with some signs of habitation going back 6000 BC. The city still exists today in modern Lebanon, often being shown on maps as Jabal, reflecting its ancient Phoenician name of Gabul rather than the Greek applied name of Byblos. Let's examine when Byblos emerged as a Phoenician city, then look at the founding dates of the other major Phoenician cities to ascertain the location and date of the origin of the society. Fish hooks and other implements from 6000 through to 5000 BC have been found in Byblos and now are displayed in the National Museum of Beirut. By 4500 BC, a small town had grown at Byblos and I have seen the lower course of stones which mark their oval shaped homes. So the conclusion comes to since the founding of Sidon, Tyre and these other cities do not predate the founding of Byblos, it must be concluded that Byblos was the first of the Phoenician cities and that the origin of the Phoenician society occurred around 3200 BC. This leaves us with only one final issue to resolve which of the two remaining origin theories is correct. Did the Phoenicians arrive from the Erythian Sea, the Persian Gulf area, or did they emerge from the Canaanites in the Levant? In the preceding analysis, we did not encounter an arrival of Phoenicians to merge with local people in Byblos and give rise to a society. No disruption occurred between 3200 BC and 12,000 BC to cause Phoenician society in the Levant to switch from seagoing to land-based evidence existence nor to change from their Semitic language to some other nor to change from being relatively peaceful to becoming militaristic so it says therefore based upon all available evidence from historical archaeological and DNA sources it can be concluded that the Phoenicians and their society emer emerged from a local Canaanite people of the Levant they did this at the city of Byblos this event occurs around the year 3200 BC and the means through which it occurred was the opening of significant trade with Egypt at the time. This was the origin of the Phoenicians and their society. I actually think that it's a bit of both. I think that the sea peoples on the coastal regions have blended with the Semitic people coming from inland, Canaanites, who I think originate from Samaria, and the merging of their cultures at this time, giving rise to a sea culture and a trading Babylonian style system. So I'm gonna finish part one here and I'll continue on Ezekiel in part two. Uh, this is getting a little bit long for one video. So thanks for listening, bye.